Regular viewers will know that I'm a big fan of the Alberta Innovate Agency's Bitumen Beyond Combustion Program. It's a research program that got started in 2018, and the intent is to turn oil sands bitumen into products, particularly carbon fiber. So I'm going to talk to Paulo Bumban, who is the Senior Manager, Clean Technology Development in the Clean Resources Division of Alberta Innovates, to get an update on where the program is at. So welcome to the interview, Paulo. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me, Markham. Now, I've talked, I've interviewed you and your your colleagues uh, a number of times uh, up until last year, but uh, we need an update. And I, my impression at the time was that as early as maybe this year or next year, uh, bitumen, you might have a, a, a commercial process ready to pilot to turn bitumen into ca uh, carbon fiber precursor, which is what, what they then use to the, the manufacturing plant uses to make carbon fiber. So are we close? We're certainly getting closer. Uh, we are, you know, 2022 was, uh, was all about phase two of our carbon fiber grand challenge. Uh, the focus of that is to, you know, in, in, increase the production of carbon fiber to about 10 grams a day, as well as working out a lot of the engineering and technical challenges. Uh, with making carbon fiber, that process is is wrapping up here in the first quarter uh, of of the, of 2023, the end of phase two, uh, and I can say the teams are making great progress. You know, carbon fiber is being made now. The quality still needs to be improved, but the teams are working through those fundamental and engineering challenges um, by the end of phase two, uh, and they'll still need some additional uh, work to be done in phase three. But we're planning to launch phase three in a couple months from now. And that will be a, a three-year program that will, I think, lead us to that, that pilot plant that you're talking about. Well, we'll get into phase, talk about phase three in just a moment. Um, I did have the opportunity to interview some of the team members who are competing in this challenge. And, and just for viewers, it, this is not like, uh, you know, a science fair in high school. Uh, we're talking about uh, scientists at the University of Calgary, uh, at other universities around Canada, but also internationally. I mean, there, there are some uh, top scientific minds who are working on the the challenge, on this technical challenge. Is that not right? That's correct. Uh, we have a team in phase two that's based in Australia at, at Deakin University. The Carbon Nexus is the facility down there. They're a, a leading open access carbon fiber development uh, facility, uh, one, one of the top in the world. And so Having their expertise uh, trying to tackle this challenge is, is, is very helpful. As well, you know, we have a team at UBC, um, you know, that's tied into the Composites Research Network, which is the sort of the end users, um, as well as, you know, we have a team out at McGill. So we, we, we've, as well as, you know, nine, sorry, eight teams based in Alberta. So we, we've, we're, we're building capacity in province in, in Alberta, but also across Canada, and we're tapping the best people on the shoulder around the world. Uh, to help us accelerate the development uh, of this technology. Well, the scientists that I interviewed uh, were actually very upbeat about uh, being able to solve the technical challenges. And this is, it's, it, and there are no small challenges, but they, they were making progress when I, the last I talked to them. Tell us about what's going to go on in phase uh, three of the, of the challenge. So the focus for phase three will be making carbon fiber reproducibly with consistent properties. So we've heard from carbon fiber companies uh, and end users that, you know, to have confidence in the end use in the product, the carbon fiber product that, that they could then use or sell to, you know, for, for, um, for whatever end use that they're looking at, it needs to be made consistently. Uh, it needs to be made reproducibly and in, in large enough quantities that they can test. So the, that will be really the focus of, of phase three. We're targeting half kilo to kilo per day. Um, and that will also allow the teams to understand um, what else might be happening in their process, what might be off gassing in their process as they heat up the samples so that then when they go make that pilot plant, they understand the environmental implications as well as the process implications for making the carbon fiber. Now, uh, at the so at the end of phase three, uh, will you have or you hope to have a process that you can then build a pilot plant uh, that will turn out, uh, I don't know what the, the volume would be, but that then becomes a demonstration plant and then it scales up to commercial production. 
have I got the process right? Yes, that's the hope that by the end of phase three, uh, there will be a reproducible process that produces carbon fiber consistently with consistent properties that is investable for either a pilot demonstration or maybe maybe straight to commercial, depending on on what the uh, the investor or the company that wants to take it forward wants to do with it. Now, I had the opportunity, I was writing an article for Alberta Views magazine, uh, and it included uh, uh, Bitumen Beyond Combustion. And I talked to Alex Walk, who's the uh, VP of Sales and, and Marketing for Zoltec Manufacturing out of St. Louis, Missouri. And he told, and I gather that he's been in touch with your team. Uh, uh, the company has, you know, throughout the the process. He's really excited about this, and he was saying that if your team, if you, you Alberta Innovates, uh, can get to the point where it can license the technology to turn out to manufacture precursor in in Alberta, then his company would seriously consider putting a plant in Alberta and a carbon fiber manufacturing plant, because you, in his words, you always locate the manufacturing plant as close to the source of the precursor as possible. Is that still the thinking around, uh, around this project? I think there's a lot of different potential opportunities and ways this could go. We could just make the precursor here uh, and then, and then ship it out to, to other uh, carbon fiber companies around the world. Ideally, we would produce carbon fiber in Alberta. That's our target. That's what we're going for. Um, but maybe, you know, well, we, we obviously won't be able to produce all the carbon fiber in the world. So the other opportunity is also to produce that precursor um, and, and ship it out. So there's, there's different um, potential um, ways to look at it, depending on, you know, the, the, you know how the business um, makes the most sense. But we are absolutely targeting the production of carbon fiber in Alberta. And we'd also like to see the downstream manufacturing um, industry that use that carbon fiber to also uh, be built up in the province as well. Now, Paulo, I want to ask you a question that is often posed to me on social media when this uh, when BBC comes up in discussion, and that is, why does it have to be bitumen? Why couldn't it be captured CO2, for instance? You know, for, for carbon fiber in particular, uh, the the when you break down to the chemistry of it, the types of molecules that are present in carbon fiber are, are, are similar to, the building blocks are very similar to what you find in, in bitumen. Carbon dioxide, or CO2, is a very primitive form of carbon. It, it's, it's one carbon versus you have long chains of carbons in bitumen. And those long chains uh, can much more easily connect together to form the really long chain that is carbon fiber versus having to put together many, many more carbon, individual carbon molecules from, from carbon dioxide to make that work. So the chemistry and the thermodynamics is much more favorable. You know, the energy requirements are much more favorable to make it from bitumen as opposed to CO2. And I guess we should point out for, for viewers that the, what you're trying to do here is create these very, very fine, almost you know, smaller than a, than a human hair, uh, very long strands that then get woven into carbon fiber. Is that correct? That that's correct. So they're typically, you know, carbon fiber is sold in in these windings of of twenty four thousand or fifty thousand windings that that make a very strong um, form of carbon fiber. It, it's not sold as an individual fiber, but they are woven. And and you're correct. The size of these are smaller than human hair, although. And when you feel it, it feels a lot like human hair. So, Paulo, uh, assuming that um, at the end of the phase three of the Grand Carbon, uh, carbon Fiber Challenge, that you've got a, a commercial process, or a, at least you can do a, a, a demonstration plant, give us a sense of the timeline uh, until, you know, there might be a carbon fiber plant in Alberta. One of the important things that we're doing along the way is is also working with end users so it's not just enough to build to, to make carbon fiber that carbon fiber has to find a home in a, in a product at the end of the day and so as we work through phase three of the grand challenge uh, the teams will also be working with end users um, who will use that carbon fiber in their products and va obviously validate that the properties are what they want and that they're consistent 
So by doing that, we're hoping to really shrink that timeline at the end of phase three so that we can move really quickly um, to, to commercial. I would get, you know, we're hoping to end phase three by, by middle of 2026. Maybe by 2030, there might be shovels in the ground for a carbon fiber plant in Alberta, assuming that we have a pilot that comes out right after phase three. Now, that's exciting around because, I mean, the, uh, one can imagine, uh, uh, you know, an entire industry uh, growing up in Alberta around carbon fiber, but the carbon precursor or the type of uh, product that you get out of this process can actually has other applications, doesn't it? It can go in cement, it can go in building products, any kind of product that requires strengthening. Yeah, that would be the... I mean, you, you'd be looking at the carbon fiber itself to to go into those types of uh, end use cases um, to, okay. to strengthen, to, to deliver. You know, we have a project right now, for example, with the University of Victoria with a professor that's looking at putting carbon fiber in concrete to make smart de-icing um, concrete. So concrete that, you know, essentially heats up in the winter, de-ices so that you don't have to shovel it, could be used in high traffic areas to reduce slips and falls, uh, for example. So it's not necessarily just the strength properties um, and mechanical properties. You might also have electrical conductivity or heat transfer that, that could be find use in, in different applications. Now, just to wrap up our interview, uh, Paulo, I, I want to uh, get back to what's a bit of a hobby horse for me uh, in the last, uh, in 2022. And that is the potential in Alberta to uh, 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 build and grow an advanced materials industry. And so BBC would be obviously be part of that. Captured CO2 being turned into products would be part of that. You, Alberta Innovates uh, uh, has Innotech uh, as a, a subsidiary that runs the Alberta Carbon uh, Conversion Technology Center in, in Calgary. Is this something, is this realistic for us to think that Alberta could be a real player uh, in the advanced materials uh, sector, you know, basically turning carbon like bit bitumen or captured CO2 into products that we use every day? I think it's realistic to think that. It's going to take time uh, to build the, the people capacity because ultimately, you know, to, to advance these industries, you need people who, who have developed the skills and the technology uh, and the understanding of how to manipulate carbon dioxide or how to how to treat bitumen so that it turns into the products that we want. Um, we, you know, beyond carbon fiber, we are sponsoring projects on other high value carbon materials like graphene or membranes for fuel cells. So we have two projects like that right out there right now. And, and the one on, on graphene, actually graphene quantum dots, like really tiny, tiny graphene particles can be used as sensors, potentially in biomedical applications or, or water sensing. So there's an opportunity to, because we have the resource, because we have, we're building the expertise in province um, to build that critical mass of people that can advance that. But if we don't train those people and we don't have that critical mass of people and keep them in Alberta, then that's not likely to happen. But the cool thing is that if you can train those people and you can develop those people, then they go off and start companies in the region. And because you're now producing these products, they're building the spinoffs that are using those products. And then you can build that critical mass um, to have that industry. But it will, it will take time, but I believe it can be done if we do it in a smart way. Right, economists talk about industrial clusters. And industrial clusters uh, generally are, I mean, they cluster in a, in a geographic region and they, they trade with each other and they have supply chains that, that support them. And uh, it, but it's, it sounds like the, you've, we've got the resource, now we're developing the human capital, we're developing the processes and the intellectual property that comes out of all of that R&D and, and that uh, you know, Alberta Innovates is, is, is spending. And then there, there will be, there will be uh, scale up. All of these projects have to have to go through the, you know, the, they start on the bench, then they get to the, the pilot stage and they get the demonstration stage, then commercial and we have to scale them up. Do you think, I, and I know there's a lot of talk in Alberta right now about putting in place the infrastructure, the, the innovation ecosystem to support that. 
uh, just an, uh, you know your take on that. Do you think that the the innovation ecosystem is in place that could support all of the what I just described? I think we're building it, and we're building it uh, over over time, and it, it's going to take time. And as you see that the progress being made, more investment comes into that ecosystem, and and you, it only takes a, like one or two um, hits to really get people excited and for more of it to to appear. And you can see that with the technology sector uh, in, in Calgary and in, in Alberta, we saw a lot of you know, movement early in like 2019 and before, and now it's really exploded because we've seen those early wins and people are getting excited and, and people are moving here to, to be part of that. Um, and so, yeah, we're building it over time. And I think the infrastructure um, can certainly get there and we'll be in place to, to support this as long as we can continue to move forward in a positive manner. Well, Paul, uh, always a pleasure. Thank you very much for this. And we'll have you back. Uh, I promise we'll have you back this year uh, for another update. Well, thank you very much, Markham. And I look forward to, to our next conversation.